All right, good morning everyone. We'll go ahead and get our meeting started this morning. We still have some people who are joining in. All right, so first I'd like to, like to welcome everybody to our, our, main, our May State Technical uh, Advisory Committee. Um, I wanted to touch on just a couple of things uh, as we get into this agenda. The, the, the purpose of the State Tech Committee this is an opportunity for for partners to to hear what NRCS is up to. Uh, if you have any thoughts, questions, feedback for the agency on are, are there opportunities for for us to serve our our state better? Are there ideas on a, on the technical side or programmatic side that we could work to improve? If things are going great, I'm, I'm happy to hear that too. But I do want to hear the feedback, and that's that's really what the main purpose of this meeting is: is to allow our partners an opportunity uh, to provide feedback in an effort to 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 work on this and to ensure that there's an opportunity to provide feedback to NRCS. Um, we, we're doing something a little different on the state tech committee. Uh, during this meeting or towards the end of this meeting, we will be in in the chat. We will be dropping in a couple of links for breakout rooms. There's going to be a breakout room that'll be set aside for uh, programs. There will be a breakout room that'll be set aside for technical. That room will also include uh, discussions on CRP and CREP. And then there's going to be a breakout room for for urban urban agriculture. We will have uh, agency liaisons in each one of those rooms that should be there to be able to answer questions and record any feedback that you may want to um, provide. Uh, with the links being in the chat, and again, we will drop those in the chat here shortly. Um, you can you can move between the meetings if you'd like to. You just have to return to this main this main. Uh, meeting to in order to access those. But if you have any questions as we move through that, don't hesitate to ask. We're happy to try to help you get to the room that you want to get to. So we're going to start off with just our main agenda this morning, and then we'll move into those breakout sessions towards the end of the meeting. So for our agency, one of the major focuses that we have had over these last few months and we will have over the next few years is this Inflation Reduction Act funding. Uh, this is a once in a generation opportunity that NRCS has received that we can make good investments across South Dakota and the nation. We're trying to find different ways to make this work. And this is and, and the state tech committee is definitely one of those ways that we're looking at trying to get the feedback to make sure that we're investing those dollars in a wise way for South Dakota. We are also going to be working on improving our local working group process to make sure that we're getting more feedback at a local level to make sure that we are treating the resource concerns that matter across the state. In an effort to continue doing this, we are going to be looking at continuing and expanding opportunities for partners through our agreements. We'll be looking at opportunities to expand our staffing capacity. Right now for South Dakota or, or up until this point, we had a staffing cap of around 300 to 314 staff for NRCS. We are looking at expanding that number up to 340 to try to absorb and increase capacity to be able to deal with this increased workload. We all we are also going to be working on increasing our training across the state to our staff as well as partner staff to try to absorb this additional workload. We have a significant backlog of work that this additional funding will help us reach. We are really excited about this opportunity, and I know that we're going to have the opportunity to actually get this on the ground over these next couple of years, especially with the help of our partners. So right now we are working on going through our current list of our, our um, CC, CCGA, CCCA. CCCA. What does that can you help me out with that acronym? And I can even our own acronym. Like from that. We'll have to make Colette come up with the acronym or say what it is. There she is. Good morning. So the CCCA is the Conservation Collaboration Cooperative Agreements, and that is the funding opportunity that we had for this year. That closed last this week. And I'll give more report on. Yep, I'll report more on that later. 
<laughs> Thank you, Colette. So there's going to be more opportunities through things like the CCCA. Uh, we are going to be going out with an announcement for our conservation innovation grants or CIGs. We'll be going out here shortly. We're going to have a little shorter window on those. We're going to open it for a 30 day um, opportunity. So you should be seeing that here shortly. Um, but there are going to be continued opportunities as we move through these next couple of years, especially as we start working on um, getting started with our strategic plan. And the national office has been putting a lot of emphasis on our roadmap to success on getting these these IRA dollars out the door. Uh, we are working on getting a contract put together right now for our strategic plan. Once that contract is in place, we will be holding three listening sessions across the state. The locations are still we're working on on final locations for all three of those uh, partner meetings. Uh, but the idea behind it is we want again to hear from our partners across the state to help drive where is NRCS going over these next few years. Our strategic plan will be a five year plan, so that's what we're looking for. And we we definitely need your input. NRCS is a locally led agency and we need the feedback from our partners to help ensure that that's what's happening. So I'm going to go ahead and open this the, the floor up. Um, I, I saw. Uh, Rebecca, do you do you want to step in and, and say anything on on the senator's behalf? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, looking forward to the breakout sessions. Actually, I think that's a really neat idea, so I'm, I'm excited for that. Um, but uh, right now in D.C., uh, we're just awaiting to see what's going to happen with the debt ceiling. Uh, Senator Rounds has been really busy with uh, banking hearings uh, this week in that realm and um, also just kind of tracking uh, the CBO score and what's going to be happening with um, the farm bill with regards to the, the spending. So um, looking at all of that and, and diving into that, but nothing of uh, real deal detail at this time. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you for attending. Thank you for that report. Um, do we have anybody on from Senator Thune or Representative Johnson's staff? Okay. Um, so next on the agenda this morning is going to be an update from Farm Service Agency. All right. Thanks, Tony. Uh, good morning, everyone out there. Uh, mine will be brief, just a quick update on what's currently available under the CRP and CREP agreements. Um, so obviously ongoing is the continuous CRP signup and the, the active CREP agreements. And currently in South Dakota, we've got five active CREP agreements, the Big Sioux River Watershed and the James River Watershed, uh, both in conjunction with the Game Fish and Parks. And then we have the three tribal creps, Ogallala, Lakota, Rosebud, and Cheyenne River in conjunction with those tribal nations. Uh, so all those signups are currently going on, uh, accepting offers and working with NRCS to get plans and, and contracts in place. Um, the general signup was earlier this spring. We're waiting on results from the national office on the acceptance and results of that signup. And the other active signup we have is the Grassland CRP. And that signup concludes May 26th. And then it will be forwarded on or available for rank and review to the national office for acceptance into that program. So that's currently what we have on the, the CRP arena with Farm Service Agency. And uh, I guess I'd field any questions if there are any. All right, so any any questions for Owen? Uh, I'll remind everybody, uh, Owen will be a part of these breakout sessions uh, later on in this meeting. If you have any specific, if you have any specific CRP or, or CREP related questions that pop up later, um, he'll be in the technical breakout room. Thank you. Thank you, Owen. Uh, Kent is next on the agenda with a soil health update. Hi, good morning, everyone. Am I coming through OK, Tony? Yes, you are. OK, so I'm going to be relatively brief um, here this morning. There's a busy agenda and then um, with some uh, really good breakout sessions that we'll have at the end. Um, so I did plan on um, giving a, just a short uh, kind of educational talk on, on soil organic matter and um, and it's important and important in various forms. Um, but I've been doing a lot of uh, 
demonstrations with the rainfall simulator here um, over the past three weeks. I've run it 18 times in the past three weeks. And I had a really good question or comment um, by a producer um, last week in Watertown. Um, so I had, had run it and we were just talking and in conversation afterwards. And and he made the point of this is a great demonstration, very effective. It's, you know, it does what it's supposed to do. It shows the importance of management on soil. Um, and, and he made a comment that I, I've heard in the past and I've had thoughts on in the past, but basically said, he said, now what? He goes, even if I want to change uh, my management, you know, these, these demonstrations are great, but what's the next steps? And so um, that got me thinking and we had a great conversation afterwards, but um, we, have a, we have a great opportunity here south of Huron with a couple of demonstration farms. And one of them is the, is the Dale demonstration farm with the Beetle Conservation District and in association with Ducks Unlimited. And a lot of work's gone into, into acquiring that land and you know just kind of getting up and running. And we can say that we're starting to do that effectively. Um, but you know, now the, the point of that demonstration farm is to do exactly what that producer was asking for. And that is to demonstrate soil health practices. How do we uh, how do you set up equipment? How do you how do you adjust your rotations? How do you uh, how do you intercede? How do you put cover crops in 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 short time frames? And so um, I'm just making everyone aware that um, we've got this this Dale demonstration farm and the Cane Creek uh, demonstration farm, which has been in existence for for a little bit longer, a couple of decades. Um, there was a handout, uh, hopefully that you all got, and it showed. Uh, basically a set of soil tests that we're going to be doing on this farm and it was pull it up real real quick and hopefully that's coming through so this is a project that we're going to be doing multi-year on the Dale demonstration farm it's basically going to track soil health properties and how they changed going from a conventional system into uh, the soil health implemented system that we're that we're adopting out there and so look through these i'm not going to go through each and every one of these um i'll thanks i uh, thank lance gunderson from um, regen ag labs for helping me with um, kind of breaking down these tests and making them understandable for even even the most lay of lay person um so I, i'd appreciate if you look through these if you have any comments certainly email me or contact me by phone um, or if there's tests on here that um or that are not on here that you would like to see um, in association with this project, we will also be uh, collecting agronomic management data, economic uh, yield data, infield assessments. Um, we've got some salinity restoration projects going on out there. So there's a lot of interesting data that we're going to be collecting over the years. Um, we do have a tour that is, or a field day going to be set up on um, Wednesday, July 12th. And so that'll be our next one coming up. And then we're working really hard to get some uh, tours and um, things set up during the state fair, so maybe we can reach some people all throughout the state while they're in Huron. Um, so with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I will turn it back to you, Tony. Thank you for everyone's time. All right, thank you so much, Kent. Our next uh, agenda item is partnerships with Colette. Good morning again. Um, thank you for the platform time. Um, so uh, with partnerships, we've been very busy working with partners and, and seeing what things are going on. Um, later in the agenda, you'll see uh, under partnerships report that we will have time for partners to provide some updates on things happening with their organizations. So I have had several people ask for time, which is great. And then uh, during that session, if you um, feel there's need to ask a question or something to your camera on and um, we'll, be, we'll be recognizing you so you can ask the question or provide an update to your organization. Um, then uh, right after my report now, I'll be asking uh, Trudy Ecofee to provide a, a partnership report on a national project. So uh, with South Dakota, we had our conservation collaboration cooperative agreements um, notice of fun funding. Uh, we started that in January and it was published for 60 days and it closed on May 6th. So the exciting news is that we have um, we received 20 proposals, which is great. 
And then um, those proposals have a value of about um, right about $17 million. And that's that's really exciting. So uh, unfortunately, we'll have to be um, uh, we'll, we'll be reviewing those and selecting the ones that best fit the needs of the agency right now for South Dakota. So, but thank you to all the partners who submitted those proposals because it's really exciting to read through and see what um, see what ideas you have. So it'd be great to continue working with everyone on those. Um, let's see, the next thing, as Tony mentioned, we will be having a conservation innovation grants announcement soon, and that will be open for 30 days. And uh, we will be sending out a news release on it. Um, something else you can do is go to grants.gov, www.grants.gov, and make sure your accounts are set up. And also, um, while you're there, you may want to browse some of the other opportunities happening through USDA. I've been seeing some really great notifications from the Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovation, and then also from the Office of Outreach. So there's definitely some opportunities there that would be um, outside of our state um, announcements that you may be interested in and could qualify for. Um, anyway, just thought I'd mention that too. So, okay, uh, any questions on grants and agreements for South Dakota NRCS? Okay, let's see. All right, well, with that, I'm going to turn it over to one of our partner guests today. And she has a, a report on their exciting new project. So Trudy, I'm, I'm handing it over to you and then we'll go back to Tony. Awesome, thank you, Colette. Oh, so wonderful to see some of the familiar names and um, some new names on the list here. And I'm, I'm thankful, um, as some of you may know, I was a former tribal liaison for the Pine Ridge Reservation. So I'm pretty familiar uh, with what NRCS does. And for the last three years, I've been the executive director of Tonka Fund, which is a nonprofit organization um, loosely based out of here on Pine Ridge. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about collaboration that we're doing with South Dakota State University. So I am not that familiar with teams, but I'm going to try to show my slide presentation here. Um, maybe, maybe not. Let's see if I can find the right one. There. Can you all see that? I'm going to start. Can you guys see that? I think you need a different screen, Dr. Ekafi. It's showing the agenda right now. Okay, let me see here. Let me try that again. Sorry about that, Alex. And I'm not that familiar with stop sharing. Stop sharing and see if I can pull this up. All right, let me see here. All right, there we go. How about that? Good, just go to presenter mode. Okay, you see all see that? All right. Okay. We see your, so your whole screen, if you can, if there's a... Um, let me see here. I don't see your presenter mode on your screen you're showing, but we see the whole screen along with the slides on the left and the helpful hints on the right. Okay. I wonder why it's not. Still the same, probably. Let me see if I can try this again. Apologies. I'm going to start my slideshow before I present. That might help me. Nope. And if not, Trudy, I do have your slides pulled up if you want me to share them instead. Yeah, would you do that? That might be better because it's not letting me cooperate. Thank you. Right. Awesome. So yes, this is uh I'll shut my screen off. Um yeah, this is a grant that we've been working on for over a year and some of you may know that um, uh, a little bit about this already, but uh, so I'm going to go through some of these slides pretty pretty quickly. If you could show the next slide, Daryl. Okay. 
So I a little bit, just a little bit more about us, Tonka Fund. We um, roughly have been in existence for six years. We are a nonprofit. And our primary goal is to support the reintroduction of buffalo or bison to the lands, lives, and economy of Native people. Um, our, our sister organization is uh, the Native American Natural Foods, which is um, Tonka Bar. And we also are um, providing assistance through a program called TRAC. Um, so a little over, well, I would have to say we've been working on this grant with SDSU for about a, a year and a half. Um, it is a USDA NRCS Climate Smart Commodities Program. Um, it is an $80 million grant that SDSU um, is uh, been awarded over five years. Um, Tonka Fund is a small part of that. We'll be receiving about a million dollars a year to support this program. It's one of three that were very um, in the US that was awarded here. Next slide, Daryl. So I'm not going to talk too long about this. This is actually a slide um, that um, Dr. Jeff Martin from SDSU, some of these slides are his, so I'm going to give credit at the bottom to him for those. But it kind of just explains, you know, what we were thinking on lines, you know, as we support producers um, in this area. Uh, next slide. I don't think I have to talk to you, the crowd of NRCS folks, about what, what, uh, what goals and accomplishments that an RCS um, wants to do. But this program, this grant is going to do the project overview is first incentive for producers. And then the second piece of it is the research. And then the third piece is the market development. Now Tonka Fund is mostly on the, the, the end of incentives for producers and enrollment of those producers and primarily native for underserved producers, both in the buffalo and cattle world. Next slide. So our goal uh, with SDSU over the next five years, um, these incentives that will be given are based on, this may all look very familiar to all, prescribed grazing, cover crop planting, forage and range planting, and upland wildlife habitat management. Um, our goal is to look at at least 30% of the funding going to historically underserved producers. Um, and it should, over time, we're looking at 850 producers, and this, and I'll show a slide later on that it's not just about South Dakota producers, it's a larger range than that, but we're looking at probably 50% of those coming from uh, South Dakota. Looking at over the next five years, 3.9 million acres, over $24 million in incentives, and then roughly $22 million, um, hopefully down the road for the commodities um, that will be part of this. Um, the next part is what we're looking at, aren't we all looking at this, is the carbon sequestration, um, the, the communities. So all the ranches that we will be enrolling will do soil sampling on. Next slide. Um, the next part of this, and I'm not, Tonka Fund will not be necessarily a big player in the commodity part of this. So if there's questions around the market development, that's something that might uh, SDSU uh, might have to explain a little in depth. And we have a lot of other partners uh, that'll be taking part in this market development outside of SDSU. Um, so I can't explain to you a lot about what that looks like right now, other than that we're hoping animals that are enrolled in this um, program will be receiving premiums. What that looks like is still being developed. Next slide. So the partners roles, these are some of the partners. AgSpire will be helping enrolling the partners, Tonka Fund, SDSU Extension, um, and the Center of Bison Excellence and Millbourne Seeds. Um, Millbourne Seeds will be primarily responsible for some of the, the uh, plantings. And then the next partner role will be um, basically in the, the research, though Tonka Fund and other folks will have some kind of you know, technical assistance in working with the producers that we've enrolled in a deeper scientific um, background. And then Buffalo Ridge and National Bison Association and Cold Creek Buffalo Company will all be part of 
the commodity part, um, the sales of it. Next slide. So this is what we're looking at for target enrollment pools. So as you can see, South Dakota is the bigger um, piece of that. Um, basically looking at the Northern Great Plains and of course grasslands, this is mostly affecting uh, grasslands. I do know that the other two USDA NRC um, grants that were awarded, um, you know, we're looking more at the cropland pieces of that, how that affects South Dakota, I'm not entirely sure. We all are also working with some of the grasslands and places down in uh, the Southeast. Next slide. So there is gonna be the data collection um, and we're hoping, my hope is working with some of the tribal liaisons uh, from NRCS and other NRCS folks here in South Dakota and other places, if we're looking for these ranchers that you might recommend to this program. There'll be the average rancher, basically very, um, you know, working with them on grazing, uh, prescribed grazing plans, um, different types of seeding and that kind of thing. And then there'll be the research rancher, which will be a lot more in depth. So if you know of folks that might fit this bill that are, um, send them our way, uh, at least the, 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 the native producers or the underserved producers, you can send toward Tonka Fund and some of the uh, other ranchers to SDSU. There'll be a lot more information coming out about this as well as we develop. We're looking at a big media splash. So the average rancher basically will be doing some mapping, you know, doing some monitoring and some soil and carbon data. Next slide. And the research rancher, which will only be six across this uh, landscape, oh, will have a lot more um, to do with the, the research part of it. Um, those will probably be somewhat hand-picked. And um, on top of that, the research rancher that is picked for some of this more in-depth um, research that's going on will actually receive um, a, a larger incentive. Next slide. So basically, um, you know, it's this looks very familiar to CSP to me, obviously, maybe with a little less um, uh, paperwork in terms of getting selected and that kind of thing. Um, but it looks very similar to me. Um, I, so I, I don't, I think one of the things when I was talking with SDSU, we want to be in partnership, obviously, with uh, the local NRCS offices and that kind of thing. Um, and work on the same team. So that's why I really am glad that I could speak about this today and at least get the, the thought process rolling on, on what that looks like. Next slide. So this is kind of the, the team um, we will recruit, and that was is Tonka Fund's main purpose, recruiting um, both beef and cattle producers, native um, or underserved. Um, we will assess, you know, the, the area. We'll look at the practices. We'll get them enrolled. Um, and then the monitoring and the verifying will, will continue. So it's, it, again, looks very, very uh, much like uh, CSP. Um, but maybe this is, can be just a little bit different and we'll work in collaborations with that. Next slide. Next slide. Is it going? Am I stuck? So there may be more questions than um, than uh, than answers that I have today. Um, a couple of things that we know that we would need to do is to be able to um, these these funds have to be not uh, already enrolled in an NRCS um, program which I would guess would look like CSP or CRP. Um, they have to be outside of that. Otherwise, um, 
equip, I'm not sure. Uh, we're getting more clarification on that. As long as that pra equip practice is not something that um, is, you know, being enrolled in this this plate uh, in this factor. And is there any more slides, Daryl? Should no, I, I I do. There is not any more slides that I can find. I was looking for okay. a different one where you talked okay. about the different programs with NRCS, but I do not see it in here. OK, all right. Yeah, you can stop sharing then and maybe I can just talk to that a little bit. Um, one of the things that will be required and I'll, is a uh, couple of things. Um, of folks that will be enrolling in this program is they will have to still go through the USDA program database. Um, so that means their lands, they'll have to have control of that land. They will have to, if they're on tribal or allotted lands, will have to have permission. Um, and again, that acreage cannot already be an NRCS uh, currently funded program that is similar. Um, they must sign the required USDA forms like the uh, form AD 1026 and the form um, CC 941 um, is anything. So it has to be enrolled in um, the USDA, I would guess, is the SKIMS program. There, so, Trudy, I was able um, to share that one slide. It was hiding before, but now I'm sharing it on the screen that lists that. OK, OK, there you go. So that is where, you know, as partners with you all, we'd like to um, you know, again, be able to partner up. You know, if you know ranchers and producers that might be interested in this program, you can send them our way. National Bison Association will also be recruiting buffalo producers. Um, SDSU and Ag Squire will be um, recruiting, uh, you know, uh, non underserved uh, producers. So, again, maybe there's more questions than answers, but. Um, I'll take a few if, if somebody wants to throw them at me. Thanks, Daryl. Thanks, Daryl, for operating that for us. And thank you very much, Trudy, for your report. And we look forward to working with you. And this is this is a really exciting time for our, our ag producers. So and we'll do our best to help you um, find those ranchers. And I was going to ask if you'd mind, please, to put your contact information in the chat, and then um, any of the people attending can grab that off for contacting you directly. So, and then we'll watch for your um, news releases and such. So, thank you, thank you. You bet. All right. Okay, so I'm going to um, conclude the um, grants and agreements update right now. And then I will um, turn it to Jeff Vanderwilt for the programs update, and I'll come back to our partners in uh, in a few minutes after in the partnership report section of this meeting. So thank you. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Jen Wirtz, who's going to give us a report on programs. Jeff is currently. Jeff's currently down in, in Arkansas right now, working through uh, some solutions for our RCPP program. So he's working on trying to help us with some fixes to make that program a little more functional, which we're really excited about. So we're happy that he's there. We're, we're sad that he's missing today, but Jen's going to present on his behalf. So take it away, Jen. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to start out with Equip real quick. And there should be handouts in your packet with these numbers. This is our first tentative numbers for the funding in the various fund pools for EQIP for fiscal year 23. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time going through each of these. Uh, there's a lot of numbers on here, so I'll let you guys take time to, to read through it. Please reach out to me if you have questions. Uh, we are not done funding at this time. Um, there's there's still several of our CIS projects on this this page of the handout with the TBD on there. Those are projects that are still getting applications ranking and we'll make funding selections on them um, hopefully in the near future. So for for equip, we're moving forward. Um, and then I'm going to just spend a little time here on IRA before we go into CSP since I'm I'm visiting right now with you. 
Um, I know we've talked a lot about the Inflation Reduction Act or IRA and the climate smart or climate mitigation uh, and, and carbon sequestration. That is what we're going to focus on in some of the breakout rooms and how we can get prepared to utilize the additional funds coming to South Dakota. Uh, so um, just as a, kind of some expected numbers coming forward, this is for the nation, not, not just South Dakota, but 8.4 billion in EQIP, 4.9 billion in RCPP, uh, 3.2 in CSP, 1.4 in ASEP, and a billion dollars in technical assistance. And, and that is just, it's an awesome opportunity for our agency to, to really help our producers in getting additional conservation out there. Um, most of you have probably seen the list, and I will share this list in more detail in the program's breakout room. Uh, as well of the practices that are designated as climate smart or that climate mitigation practice uh, that we can utilize the IRA funding for. And then just going forward off of that, um, we can also use facilitating practices to, to manage uh, and implement that mitigation for climate. And these are just an example of some, some potential pairings of uh, the, the IRA designated practice, which would be here conservation crop rotation. Uh, cover crops actually is another IRA, but we could do um, irrigation water management to support that crop rotation or the pest management conservation systems. Uh, or what used to be integrated pest management, those could all be facilitating practices to support the IRA practices. Uh, prescribed grazing is, is going to be a big one too across the state of, of being the mitigation practice, but to support that surprise, so, excuse me, support that prescribed grazing system we can utilize the watering facility, pipeline, fence, um, if we need a structure for for wildlife or for excuse me, for livestock, uh, which would be a fabricated windbreak, we could utilize them as facilitating practices through that money as well. And this this slide just kind of goes into the that systems for multiple different benefits of yeah, we are you're, you know we're targeting to the climate smart that carbon sequestration, but there is other benefits to those systems which we all know we are all conservation minded on this call. Uh, so we're going to be do be able to do some more more uh, wildlife benefits to different habitats um, through that, or you know just what what uh, Dr. F. Ekafi had talked about of, of getting livestock producers out there um, and utilizing prescribed grazing. Uh, just a quick, a very quick overview of some of the IRA strategies in South Dakota. Uh, for EQIP in fiscal year 23, the our EQIP ad hoc committee. Um, decided to target based on primary land use for the funds that we received in 23. So if the the majority of the lands in an application was cropland, we would target that towards cropland. Um, again, if it was grazing lands, we'd target towards the grazing lands. And that just helped to spread some of the funding across the different primary land uses. Also through EQIP, um, and this is another point we'll get into in the breakout rooms, um, we are piloting what is in our uh, policy through the Farm Bill 18 called ACT Now, which is supposed to be a more streamlined process for obligating contracts. So we haven't 
haven't used it much as an agency and we haven't used it at all yet in South Dakota. So this is our first first time out of the gate with that process. Uh, we have two different resource units, one in the, the peer area, one in the Brookings area that are piloting the Act Now process. Um, so hopefully we can utilize that moving forward in 23 to, to have some more expedited funding opportunities. Uh, CSP and Val uh, Duprez is going to present on CSP a little more here in a minute. But uh, for IRA funding, we targeted towards the resource units and also beginning farmer and socially disadvantaged. RCPP is targeting on the, the proposal level for climate mitigation. And I didn't get the this added into the slide yet, but ASEP is also having a national sign up. Um, and then we will we can have applications into that national sign up. And Brandon will be talking about that later on as well. Um, and we also in our breakout room going forward, we're going to be looking for different ways to utilize our partnerships and help to bring those opportunities to the producers. Um, and let's see, I need to try to. That was all I was going to share on this PowerPoint at this time. I need to just be able to end it. All right. Any questions? I know I was brief here, but I know we're going to be um, dealing with more of this in the program breakout room later on as well. And if not, I'll pass it on to. Um, Let's just go with Val. I don't have the agenda up right at the moment, but let's just go with Val uh, to talk about CSP. And um, since Jeff is not here, Valerie DePrez is our new CSP program manager for South Dakota. She just started here, oh, about a month ago, um, taking over for Joyce Trevithick, who was the, the manager before that. So. I'll pass it to you, Val. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jen. Um, yeah, I'm Val Dupreez. I've been on the job about a month. Uh, this is my first state tech committee with you, so I'm. it's a pleasure to be here. I am going to provide kind of an overview of uh, CSP kind of on a, an annual basis. So um, for this year, we processed a lot of payments. Um, that's just our normal process that we go through. Um, we'll start uh, processing payments in October and our goal is to be completed by March. So we've had a few snafus, got a few pay payments hanging out there yet that we're still working on. But uh, for the most part, payments are pretty well wrapped up. Uh, we paid on over 1,200 contracts and uh, 2.6 million acres. We paid out about 36 and a half million dollars uh, for activities that were completed in fiscal year 2022. Uh, we rolled into our 2023 renewals and general signups. Our renewals were obligated by the end of December, um, and our general signups were still obligating now, but we're getting close to wrapping them up. So uh, coming into the year, we had 984 applications that uh, were deferred or rolled over to this year. Um, and we were able to fund 85 renewal applications uh, across 234,000 acres with uh, pretty close to $11 million. So um, of those, Nearly $11 million, we had more than 20% of those dollars going to historically underserved participants. That's beginning farmer and or socially disadvantaged applicants. We fast forward to our classic application period and obligation period, which you know started, uh, we ranked in February, March, and we've been working on obligations since. We were able to fund 97 applications across 227,000 acres uh, with a little over $14 million. There again, um, you know, over 20% of our obligations been 
uh, allocated to historically underserved producers. Uh, we have a, a CSP Grasslands Conservation Initiative. Uh, we obligated 33 contracts across 1,900, a uh, little over 1,900 acres with 172,000. So the eligibility for that GCI or Grassland Conservation Initiative um, ties back to some base acres that are no longer uh, considered in crop status. They're more of a grazing or forage base. There's some criteria um, that is associated with that, um, and it goes along with some of the reporting at FSA. Uh, we're currently working on our 2023 uh, Inflation Reduction Act CSP sign up. Um, we received $4.8 million for our IRA related uh, CSP contracts. Uh, our obligation date is set for mid-July, and at this current point in time, we've got 38 applications selected. I don't have an acre amount available yet, but, um, you know, we're just getting our letters in the mail to our selected applicants. So, um, you know, looking forward to this next quarter, we're going to be looking at our 2024 renewal applications. So, we have our Fiscal year 2019 CSP contracts expiring at the end of the calendar year and they're eligible for renewal. We have about 245 contracts covering 713,000 acres. Our sign up date was April 28th. I don't have a final number on the number of applications and we don't have our allocation um, yet. So, more information to come on that. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Val. Jen, thank you both so much for the report. Do we by any chance have Matt on today? Matt should yep, be on. I I'm here. Brandon is on as well. All right. Are you two ready to give some sort of report also? You bet I can go first here. All right. Hopefully you guys can see my screen here. Um, it's on page 10 of your handout from Kathy. So a brief update on ASEP uh, before we go into our breakout session. Uh, for fiscal year 23, uh, we had 45 applications uh, for WRE. Uh, from that pool. Right, Brandon, your, um, your handout moved to the side, so we just see your desktop. Okay. There you go. All right. Uh, from that, like I said, we had 45 applications. Uh, we did have enough funding to select eight of those, uh, which covers about 817 acres for pretty close to 3.3 million. Uh, for ALE, uh, we did have eight applications this year. Uh, from that, we were able to select one parcel. Uh, it's just a hair under a thousand acres. Uh, so we're moving through the process with our acquisition process for all the easements. Uh, regarding IRA, I'll get into more detail in the breakout section, but um, in a general overview, all of the applications that were not selected for funding uh, in the normal farm bill were all turned over and also ran through the system for IRA. So that's roughly 30 some and some change for WRE and then uh, we did have an additional one for IRA for ALE, so we submitted nine um, applications for the ALE funding. Um, as Jen mentioned briefly earlier, that is a national sign up. Uh, so we as the state are not making those selections. Those are being handled by our EPD uh, team. Um, from the follow up information I got yesterday is those selections are not made at this time. Um, they are currently being routed through the EPD leadership for their selection. So. Uh, we're getting a little late in the time frame uh, when it comes to easements and the acquisition process. So, uh, like his fingers crossed, that gets handled soon so we can wrap up. So, we'll cover a little bit more of that uh, in our breakout session, and I'll hand it over to Matt next for RCPP. All right. Morning, everybody. Um, those of you that don't know, I'm Matt Morlock. I'm the new RCPP coordinator for South Dakota here, and I've been on 
the owl didn't move for me. Oh, no, no. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Oh, I'm sorry. Technology is something we're learning. But anyway, New York, I'm the new RCPP coordinator. Um, I got to say, I'm used to being in your guys' seat, so it's a little bit odd to be on the NRCS seat now and having this spotlight on me with this program. But um, we're excited. There's a lot coming up and going on with RCPP, but we haven't given an update in a long time on this program. So what I thought I'd do is kind of walk through the eight active contract or programs we have going on right now. Um, to kind of give you guys a brief update on each one of those. Um, and the first one we have is the Big Sioux Project, um, which is one of our most long lasting projects that's been going on for quite a while. Currently, we, we've got 13 producer contracts that are in the obligation phase. Um, so we're gonna be funding about $171,000 through that project. Um, it's been, and we're getting close to closing out that. We've about have all the funds obligated with that program. Um, we'll probably be holding one more batching period um, through the RCPP with Big Sioux. Um, of note with that is they're pretty evenly distributed in the watershed um, with Lincoln County, Minnehaha, Dual and Union all have contracts going on through that, this sign up. Um, the next project, we have the Northeast Glacial Lakes program. Um, this is a new one. They had their first batching period, which closed a couple months ago, and which is typical with a new one. Um, there was one project that's been moved to the obligation phase. Um, we typically start out small and get the kinks worked out, and they'll be um, setting up a new batching period soon um, to open it up for applications again. And we'll expect a bigger sign up this next time with that project. Um, WWF has a building ranch resiliency uh, project going on that's active all of Western South Dakota and then 10 counties in ne Nebraska as well. Um, that project is currently open for sign up um, and it is open through June 1st. So any partners out there working West River, if you know producers that are looking to do some grazing land improvement, um, and being connected with the larger ranching community um, to talk about issues and, and resiliency. Um, there's an opportunity going on right now. Um, so I'd encourage you guys to, any producers that you think are interested in it, talk to them about going to the field offices um, and signing up an application for this project because it's a good opportunity. Um, there's about a million dollars available through that project. Um, so there's plenty of opportunity to do some grazing work out West River there. Um, the next project we have um, that's active is the conservation easements in the Black Hills through South Dakota Eggland Trust. Um, we finalized the programmatic partnership agreement, which was a big step. Um, getting that signed and agreed to uh, takes quite a bit of time. So now we're moving on with that one into the supplemental agreement phase. Um, so shortly we'll be able to take, you know, the South Dakota Eggland Trust will be able to uh, enroll a couple easements in the Black Hills. Um, it's really focusing on development pressure that's going on in the hills right now. Um, so be uh, be looking for more updates on that program soon. Um, the, the, the fifth one I wanna talk about is the Lewis and Clark and Lower James Water Quality Project through the James River Watershed Development District. Um, this one, we're very close to also having a batching period come up because we're, we're just finalizing the last bit of ink on the supplemental agreement with NHQ on that one as well. So both that one and the previous one, we're, we're close to being able to sign up producers. Um, and we're excited to get those active and going because I know there's a lot of backed up interest in both those programs. I do have to apologize under this RCPP classic slide. There is one project that I I sent an, an old draft to Kathy um, that was left off and that's the Belfouche River Watershed Project. Um, that one's also an older one that we have going on and we're actually getting close to being able to close this one out. Um, the previous batching period, there were six contracts that moved on to the obligation phase that we're finalizing. And then we also have 20 new contracts that are going through ranking right now. Um, talking with, with the folks out there, they're looking at doing a second one, a second RCPP. So this project should be ongoing, but like I said, we're getting ready to close out this one. Um, the other two projects are both AFA projects, which stands for Alternative Funding Arrangements. I mean, these projects are, are a little different than the ones I talked about because they're more partner driven. Um, so our NRCS doesn't have as big of a role in them, um, but they're exciting, um, exciting to us because they're, they're very innovative. Um, and the first one to talk about is scaling soil health in the Prairie Pothole region. This one's through Ducks Unlimited. Um, they have 17 projects that are currently about ready to be contracted and ready to be, be awarded. 
Um, that was through their first batching window. Um, and I, I talked to Bruce yesterday and saw that they're meeting this morning to go over several new project proposals. So that one's going to be an ongoing sign up and very, very actively enrolling as the year goes goes through. It's not going to have a, a traditional hard batching window. Um, the last one we have right now active in the state is expanding soil health through carbon markets, which is through American Coalition of Ethanol. That one too is kind of working on a constant sign up, and I know they're working with producers right now um, to get some contracts going. Um, that probably is really focused on minimizing tillage and input costs and using cover crops and things like that to reduce carbon footprint. Um, so I did all that to kind of give you an idea of the broad scope of projects that are available and what we can do with our CPP. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of flexibility. Um, and that's leading up to the big part of what I want to talk about, and that's an upcoming new notice of funding opportunity. Um, that's going to be coming out tomorrow, actually. Um, and this new NFO is going to be, it's going to be a lot different, um, I think, than, than future previous RCPP signups. As Tony alluded to, there's a lot of challenges that have been, been with this program, just getting through agreement phases and things like that. This new NFO is going to be addressing that, and I think it's going to be a lot, a lot different process. So, um, like I said, it's going to be released tomorrow on the 18th and there's gonna be upcoming trainings um for our staff nrcs staff there's gonna be a may 23rd training date so i encourage everybody to hold off questions um until the 23rd when we actually have a training um but you know get through and read those in that nfo that comes out tomorrow and start getting familiar with it um but then on the 23rd we'll be having our training there's gonna be partner trainings on may 24th and then on june 7th as well and we'll be sending out notices to everybody on that so that you know that they're coming up and make sure you take part in them. But um, this go around with this NFO, funding's going to be increased dramatically from what we've previously seen. Um, we're going to have approximately 500 this one, um, which is an increase of over $200 million, and that's because of IRA. Um, and this is kind of a sign of what's to come, so um, there's going to be a lot a lot more need for partners and a lot more opportunity for partners to grow for our CPP. So um, I'm going to encourage everybody to take a strong look at at this NFO and kind of get ready for, if, if not this one, future ones, because there's going to be a ton of funding available coming forward. Um, the last thing I want to hit on, and then I'll turn it back over, is um, at the next state tech committee meeting, we're going to be asking formally for partners that want to assist us in a review process of all the RCPP programs for the state. Um, this is new, this is a new step. Traditionally, the state hasn't had a partnership ranking process. Um, so that's gonna be coming. I wanted to get everybody to think about it because like I said, next state tech, we're gonna ask for people to formally volunteer to do this project. I mean, I think it's gonna be a good, great opportunity for folks that are gonna be considering about proposals in the future because it's gonna let you see what's going on and get a little bit of an inside look on it. So I'd really encourage partners out there to think about those opportunities and taking part in that review committee when it when it comes out in September. That's all I have. Um, I'll turn it back to the to the state office. Or to Jen. Right. I don't know if Jen had something too. You think somebody else had a had something for programs, Matt? No, I think that's all, Tony. Okay. Unless there's Perfect. questions. Okay, does anybody have any questions for the programs team? And again, if you have further questions, there will be an opportunity to ask them questions in the programs breakout room. So I definitely want to uh, say thank you to the programs team and also welcome to Matt and Val into their new roles. We're really, really excited to have them on board. All right, so moving down the agenda, uh, we have Jess up with a technical update. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, Jessica Mahulski, State Resource Conservationist. Um, I'm, I'm going to have a pretty brief update. Um, our staff is going to cover um, some cha any changes that we've made to practice standards and technical notes, um, both uh, on the engineering side and ecological sciences side, those will be covered in the technical breakout session. So if you wanna know specifically um, what changes have been made um, here in April, 
uh, please join that session and that will be covered in that breakout session. Uh, but I just want to provide a couple of reminders. Um, you know, our, our staff, both the ecological sciences, and engineering and soil staff all um, work together to update any needed practice standards and specifications and technical notes basically twice a year. We do that in either October or April in South Dakota, uh, just to try and <laughs> keep that to, you know, kind of a limited time frame so that we don't get so overwhelmed with, with changes and our field office staff and partners don't get so overwhelmed with changes. So I just want to remind everybody that that's when um, that happens. We also, um, our staffs work uh, hand in hand with the program staff. Um, basically at about this time every year to look at any payment scenarios that are needed for our conservation practice standards for the next fiscal year. So um, if you are a partner or a, you know, an individual that has some ideas about how we can improve our, our payment schedules, you can sure contact someone on the technical uh, staff or the program staff, and, and we can work through that. Um, one example, I, I recently worked with an individual who had wanted us to add some duck some duck nesting um, boxes to our payment schedule, and so we met, and we're going to be doing that for 2024. So it's just a, a good reminder that if we're missing something that maybe we should be looking at, um, that's what all of you are are out there for, is to, is to help us with that process. Um, but again, we'll cover more detailed information in the technical breakout session. Um, I will have Brandon Walter in there um, on the ecological sciences side. We'll have Andy Oxford as the acting state soil scientist in there. And then also Joy Cordier Jensen from the engineering staff. Um, I will be leading the urban uh, breakout session because my urban conservationist, Rachel Fry, is actually out in the field today. Um, so if there's any questions on urban, you can sure join that breakout session. That's all I have, Tony. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Jess. All right, so next on the agenda is partnership reports. Colette, if you would mind taking that over. Sure, you bet. Oh, this is this is the fun part of the meeting, I think. So we get to hear uh, from our partners uh, some updates on what they're doing. And it is my pleasure today to introduce uh, Jessica Howell who is going to tell us about the um, Smithso uh, excuse me, uh, Smithsonian's Shorebird Collection. And then after Jessica, um, we will hear from uh, Matt Gottlob and Bruce Toy in that order. So thanks, I'll turn it to you, Jessica. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for the time. Uh, I know a lot of you, I worked with ABC, American Bird Conservancy, as a partner out of the Buffalo field office for the past four years. And I've been with the Smithsonian for a little over a month now, and I'm excited to talk about a new initiative under their Migratory Bird Center, which is the Shorebird Collective. Um, so the Shorebird Collective basically brings together thousands of data sets um, from over 30 species of shorebirds that scientists have compiled over the years. Um, you know, oftentimes these are things that go into academic journals and they're not necessarily instantly available for conservation. Uh, so the collective aims to change that, to make that research more directly linked to the on the ground work. So that's the overall goal, is to be able to contribute to habitat work. Um, and I am the local conservation specialist. We're a team of five um, and I am based out of Colstrip, Montana now. So a little outside the state, but still pretty close by um, and we're focusing on the prairie potholes and the northern great plains i can show you exactly why here in a minute uh but uh you know that kind of the why is shorebirds have declined like unfortunately many other groups of birds often over 50 percent declines in the populations some species it's over 70 percent um i think everyone thinks of shorebirds you know as kind of a habitat specialist group um, you know, the little birds that are on beaches. But what's really cool is they actually inhabit a really diverse array of habitats, um, including both the uplands on our rangelands, as well as wetlands that are on the rangelands or embedded in crop fields. And South Dakota hosts a number of breeding shorebird species, as well as migrating species, species that are just stopping here in the spring and fall, maybe on the way to the Arctic, 
maybe in Alaska, maybe even all the way up to Russia. Um, so it's pretty crazy how far some of these birds go. Um, there's a lot of management practices that are really relevant to them. They like the short to medium grass on rangelands, so they're part of a healthy grazing system. Uh, they like wetlands with a low amount of vegetation and a nice shoreline providing kind of some water that's less than four inches typically. So uh, I think there's a lot of connections with shorebirds between uh, grazing management, soil health, and then also erosion, uh, nutrient runoff, and sediment runoff even. And a lot of those climate smart practices do pertain to shorebirds from prescribed grazing to uh, wetland restoration and, you know, the kind of uh, the practices that go along with all those. Um, so I wanted to share, let's see if I can share this sc screen here. Um, can you see the, the PowerPoint I have here? Yes. Okay, yeah, so this, this is an overall map that shows um, those birds that have been tracked, it overlays everything. Um, and you can see that both when we're talking about the number of species and the number of individuals, um, the Dakotas, uh, Montana, everything in the Prairie Pothole region, Northern Great Plains really lights up as well as the Gulf Coast. And that's kind of the connection there. Um, we haven't done a state report yet for South Dakota, but we're certainly interested in, in doing these state reports uh, this is Wyoming's, and this is kind of, a, I think, just under a 250 square mile kind of grid uh, showing where you've got different individuals using areas. Um, so I think these kind of maps could perhaps be used for uh, projects and all. Let's see, I'll stop sharing the screen now. Um, for projects like CIS, um, maybe there's a role with RCPP, maybe just providing uh, mapping tools and focal layers because uh, these are really fine scale data. They can tell us about the exact times that shorebirds are in the area and even down to the exact field they're on. Um, so, you know, I've got some ideas. I'd love to brainstorm with people looking forward to the breakout sessions. Um, and definitely I'll drop my contact info in here, reach out with any ideas. There's definitely an outreach component too, because I want producers to be aware of that. Um, they're caring for the habitat, not only for breeding shorebirds, but for shorebirds that are just, you know, passing through on their way to the Arctic, which is really cool, the kind of connections between um, the Northern Great Plains and many other parts of the world. So, but thank you for the time um, and listening. And yeah, I'll drop my contact info in the chat. Excellent. Thank you, Jessica. That is exciting. And it's fun to hear the enthusiasm and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Heidi. Yes. Um, next, we will have a report from Matt with Pheasants Forever, please. All right. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, uh, my name is Matt Gottlieb. I am the new state coordinator for Pheasants Forever here in South Dakota. Been on just over two weeks here, so I worked with a lot of you through my previous position as a range and wildlife conservationist out of Belfouche, working on the sage grouse initiative. So. June would have been seven years in that position. So I'm uh, really excited to take over the team of biologists here in the state. So um, they're still chipping away as usual. Um, talked with one of the seniors this morning. They said uh, uh, the update is kind of status quo, just chipping, uh, chipping away and moving forward. So do have a few more positions that'll be being um, either backfilled and uh, or filled uh, for the first time. So the peer position, uh, we're looking the week of Memorial Day for the biologists there to get started. And uh, we've transitioned the position from Faith to Wall, and that biologist will be starting the 12th of June. And the Belfouche, excuse me, Belfouche position should be starting uh, about the same time, either the 12th or 19th. Um, working through a few things with all those positions, just kind of little um, intricacies of uh, little tricks with each of those, but uh, then the Faulkton or Miller position that closes tomorrow. So uh, hopefully be doing interviews the following week and then hopefully getting somebody on by uh, middle to late June with those as well. So I'll drop my contact info in the chat as well. I uh, didn't have a whole lot and if folks got questions, they can either ask them now or follow up later on. Thanks for your time this morning. Thank you, Matt. Yes, it's great to be working with you and, and congratulations on your positions with the business. Uh,
if there are any other partners that would like to speak up. If, if you wanted to say a few words about what your organization is doing, just turn your camera on and, and then get you queued up. So Bruce, to you. Yeah, thanks Colette. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to hop on here. Uh, as Matt mentioned earlier, we've been uh, pretty pretty busy with uh, RCPP in Eastern South Dakota here. Uh, last uh, 2022, we had our first sign up, and over the past couple of months, we've uh, finally uh, um, signed up three uh, of those landowner agreements with RCPP, uh, looking to impact about 2,400 acres in Eastern South Dakota, uh, including uh, restoring about 600 acres of marginal cropland back to grass. So we're pretty excited about that, and we have some pretty neat uh, soil health management plans and a lot of grazing infrastructure to help with the with the livestock rotational grazing on those projects. Um, over the past couple of months, we had our second uh, second sign up and received about 17 applications uh, for RCPP, and we're in the process of kind of ranking those uh, to help fund that that next batch of uh, of applicants in the next uh, next year or so. Uh, so that will uh, likely be wrapping up our South Dakota component of of that RCPP process. Um, uh, as a reminder, it is a three state proposal. Uh, North Dakota had their first sign up here this this past spring uh, too. Another project we have, uh, we were awarded a, a grant with the Grazing Lands Conservation Initiative. Uh, don't have that grant agreement set forth yet, but uh, we're pretty excited about the opportunity there. Uh, really looking to try to help find uh, find ways to connect uh, you know, livestock producers with uh, uh, some of those IRA dollars coming in the next couple of years and help help folks get some more uh, uh, watering facilities and, and fence and, and help uh, help them manage the. Uh, grazing lands in eastern South Dakota there too. So pretty excited about that opportunity. Uh, and we do have a, a new biologist uh, on the team here, uh, Kenna Hammonds uh, out of out of the Sioux Falls area. Uh, they will be focusing on the kind of south central part of the state, which our which our staff has kind of been been missing over the past couple of years. So help kind of helping out rounding out our conservation team. So we're excited to have Kenna on board. But thanks for the opportunity here, Colette. You bet, and thank you. And again, it's it's really fun to hear all the exciting things happening and partners working together for our farmers and ranchers. So at this time, I'm going to invite any questions for our partners for their reports. You can either um, open your mic or you can um, put something in the chat. And if there are any folks who would like to provide an update from the organization, so that'd be great. Um, I see uh, Mike Beck, you have a, a question? Your hand is up. <laughs> I think I think it was a technical glitch. Oh, sorry. That's good. All right, well, I, I thought I'd just check to see if any of our uh, partners with um, the closer partners. I do want to take a moment just to recognize um, in June, there'll be some events coming up. And um, one of them is with our partners, the conservation districts. And as NRCS is working on strategic planning, the conservation districts also are, are doing planning and working with partners. So they will be having area meetings in June. And the part of the... Um, the point of those meetings is local um, roundtable discussions with partners. So please, please uh, connect with Angela if you don't have those dates and locations. And then that'll be an opportunity just for more for, for collaboration and conversation about all these great projects and activities that are happening, but, but more so at the area and more locally level, local level for locally led conservation efforts. So, okay, I'll put that plug in. I guess if there aren't any other um, updates right now, I'll turn it back to you, Tony, so we can get started on the next uh, next session. All right, thank you so much, Colette. And I, I failed earlier in the agenda to recognize our two sister agencies that are also on the call today. I saw that uh, Steve Dick uh, joined with Farm Service Agency. Uh, Steve, do you have any comments you'd like to make to this group? I saw him join. Okay. I might be looking at the wrong thing. All right, there you go. I'm messing up again. Okay, maybe he's not actually on there. I saw him on one list, but maybe he's not actually on here today. So I would like to go ahead and and we the last agenda item that we have is is other, 
And I know that one person came up and wanted to just make at least one announcement. And Kathy, this is your opportunity to make your announcement. Can you hear me from here? Yes. Okay. Um, first of all, I would just like to announce that I am uh, retiring as of May 31st. So um, I just wanted to thank all of you for um, all the time that I have worked with you over the years. And I appreciate all your um, uh, input when I asked for it or anything like that. So I just wish you all well, and hopefully I'll see you sometime across and another time. And just remember to keep and, and encourage you to work with NRCS with helping the people help the land. So thank you. Thank you, Kathy. All right, so we are going to go ahead and transition into our breakout sessions. So in the chat, so if you look at the top bar of your Teams app, there should be a little chat bubble. If you click on that, you scroll through the chat, you should see some links. And the links will look, they'll say, uh, for example, urban breakout se uh, session, and it'll have click here to join this meeting. So if you decide which meeting you'd like to join, go ahead and click there. I'm going to give all the uh, the liaisons from NRCS just a, a minute or two to get set up and going. So if you give them just maybe a five minute window to get into their respective rooms, they will go ahead and, and get those things started. So we'll see you in the breakout rooms in about five minutes. If you can't get in for whatever reason, just drop a note in this chat and I'll try to help you get there. So thank you all. Thank you for participating and we'll see you shortly.